Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Buy World Trade Center and CABSAT, I'd like to wish a very warm welcome to everyone who is taking time out of their busy schedules to join us for today's CABSAT.virtual webinar. On behalf of DWTC, I'd also like to give a very big thank you to all of this country's frontline workers who are playing a vital role in keeping us safe at this crucial time. The Buy World Trade Center looks forward to welcoming you all to CABSAT from the 26th to the 28th of October. But in the meantime, we're fortunate to have a fantastic lineup of speakers here today who will help us shed light on an issue that has not only had a worldwide effect on the broadcast media industry, but one which will affect billions of consumers. As we all know, the coronavirus outbreak has caused unprecedented disruption to almost every industry and broadcast media. Delayed production has forced broadcasters to think outside the box in order to feed hordes of content-hungry subscribers, but they are nonetheless unable to hide from the fact that revenues will be significantly impacted by the current climate. However, global lockdowns are now beginning to ease, and following the announcement that Hollywood film and TV production studios can resume production as of tomorrow, companies will be adapting to a new era of strict regulations to stop the spread of coronavirus and to protect their cast and crew. To give you just a brief glimpse of how the film industry has been affected by the current climate, take a look at this recent finding. As you can see, the impact of the coronavirus on box office receipts is estimated to have been a staggering $17 billion as of the end of May. While that statistic sinks in, and just before I introduce today's panelists, I'd like to draw your attention to a few housekeeping points. Uh, throughout the course of this webinar, audience members will be able to ask questions and share their thoughts through the chat function at the bottom of the screen. And we encourage you to use that throughout the course of the discussion. Um, there will also be various poll questions interspersed throughout the course of today. Um, today we have an excellent lineup of speakers um, who are here to discuss the ways that broadcast media ha or has been or will be forced to adapt to the challenges that have resulted from the abrupt shutdown in content production and the ways that the industry can recover as work begins to resume. Um, Firstly, it's a great privilege to have, uh, have with us here today, Tracy Grant, the Vice President of Content and Channels for Viacom CBS Networks Middle East. Um, Viacom CBS Networks comprises many of the world's most iconic consumer brands, and Tracy is responsible for a range of local productions, as well as the editorial strategies for Comedy Central, Nickelodeon, and Paramount Channel brands in the region. Welcome, Tracy. Thanks, James. Nice to be here. Thank you very much. Um, next up, we have Khaloud Abu Homos, founder and CEO of Arab Format Lab. Um, Khaloud is the founder and CEO of the startup company that delivers premium and socially relevant scripted and non-scripted Arabic content with a presence across the UAE, Saudi Arabia and Egypt. Welcome, Khaloud. Thank you. Nice to uh, be here. Thank you. Um, next, we have uh, Catherine Mwangi, Head of TV Production and Programming for Kenya Television Network. Um, Catherine leads the programming and production functions for four TV stations, all of which sit under the Standard Group PLC. Welcome, Catherine. Thank you very much, James. Thank you. Uh, and lastly, we have Nick Grand, the CEO and founder of Mina.tv, the online content marketplace for the Middle East and North Africa region. Uh, Nick is also the managing director of Channel Sculptor, the Dubai based strategic consultancy and service provider. Welcome to everyone. Um, um, so, um, obviously, we've had some good news in the last uh, week or two uh, that production in some studios is able to resume. Um, I'd like to start off today's discussion with, uh, with you, Khaloud. Um, obviously, it's great to hear that you're now back in the studio doing what you do best, uh, shooting content. Um, and this certainly represents a major step uh, going forward, I suppose. Um, just my first question to you is, um, how are you adapting your content given the restrictions that are currently in place? Uh, and what steps are you taking now that lockdown restrictions are beginning to ease?
Uh, if you could just unmute, unmute yeah. your mic. Yeah, you. sorry. Um, during the lock uh, time, uh, we took that as an opportunity as a company to focus on our writer's room and concept development. So we kept the teams up and busy during all of this time. Um, now, uh, the good news is we have been given uh, the green light to start uh, two productions um, after being stopped uh, at the beginning of the whole uh, COVID uh, crisis. We, so we are in our six days in a feature production in the UAE uh, and we have good news that we were given yesterday the green light to continue shooting our docudrama Layla in KSA which was stopped in mid of production. So uh, the, the thing is everyone is excite, excited and it's a total different world uh, for setting for the production and for executing the production. Uh, um, and the other thing is that on a daily basis, we receive from the authorities guidelines uh, which are relevant to details of production, like the number of people that could be on set, which went from 10 to 12 and yesterday we were told we can go up to 20. It affects everything, so safety and health um, become a department within each company as important as the unit production, as the script, as the art department, as so uh, yes, it, it impact, in, impact your uh, budgeting, it impacts your design, it impacts your scripts, um, especially when these now uh, we will be in production and these instructions uh, will change and they change from one country to the other. Um, so, so how important do you think that communication with uh, government authorities is? Do you think it's, it's essential, I suppose, they're in constant communication with you to ensure that you can um, move things forward as much as possible? Absolutely. Um, also that we are getting uh, lots of direction and help from the government. So when you are on set, uh, you have the representative from the health ministry, you have someone who's there on security, you have um, like a full, and that actually is a support and is our, out of our budget, but it gives everyone the security that you have someone there with you. Um, and it, it, just, it just makes everyone focused on the creative or logistical work that you have. Uh, so yes, like every hour we have, uh, you know, someone who's controlling everyone, directing everyone, testing everyone. And the pre-production becomes much more, uh, um, delicate and uh, complex because you know there's testing there's um, you know having to keep everyone in one place uh, while doing the whole production so there's people like in our case we are uh, 150 people who are staying in one ho in one hotel that have been blocked uh, for us through the production um, and uh, it's it's just the pre-production is becomes a bit complex, but once you go through that and all the department understand that it's a reality of life, uh, you go back to focusing on content and finding creative solutions. Good. Uh, Excellent. So, so um, certainly uh, very positive signs. And um, again, congratulations, I suppose, that things have resumed in an orderly fashion. Um, I'd like to move the conversation um, over to, uh, to Tracy next. Um, uh, first, welcome again, Tracy. Um, I'd be very keen to hear uh, just how Viacom CBS has been looking to adapt its content given the restrictions that have been in place uh, and which genres of content, if any, do you think will be impacted the most uh, and where do you think the biggest opportunities will lie as lockdown measures begin to ease? Thanks, James. Yeah, I mean... Look, it's an extraordinary challenge that we've all on this uh, on this webinar um, are experiencing, and it's a you know a global conundrum. It's not uh, one one particular broadcaster or another. Um, but I think that the great thing is is that if you are you know a, a, a content producer that produces great content that entertains people, these kind of challenges and restriction they really do um, make a make a good base for for imagination um, so necessity is the mother of all invention as as we know and so i think that all genres um have been hit hard by by lockdowns or and restrictions that people have had um, whether you require an audience in your production whether you're a comedian and you require that 
kind of live feedback from your from your audience to see how your jokes are going um or whether it's you know connection on set with a you know with a drama or, or scripted show so i don't think anyone has escaped um the 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 challenges of, of this time as far as genre goes um but i think the great thing is is that when uh, these things happen um we have a very local approach in, in Viacom. So we have local and, and international libraries um, that we, you know, a huge inventory of content that we can kind of tap into. So we're very lucky in that respect. Um, that said, when you, when you do have these um, periods of time, it, it does make for creative um, use of, of all of the people that normally deal with production. So whether it's your writers, I know Halud said that the writers room was really um, kind of ramped up during during lockdown. And I think, um, you know, it, if you can if you can find really good stories and connect with your audience when they're all experiencing the same thing, then that's the most important thing to do. Excellent. Um, I believe you had some um, some extra information you were keen to share with yeah, I, I can talk about one of our one of the uh, shows that that Viacom CBS have worked on is is Balcony Stories. Um, that is a it's a long form and and short form user generated uh, content. So really, what we've done is we've transformed both not only our talent but also our audience into the the main protagonists, the storytellers uh, of this show. So across our entire network, um, during the months we we've kind of picked up these stories from people's balconies um, and in each uh, market that that Viacom CBS operate in we um, have produced it for you know all of our linear channels and digital uh, and we were re really able to tell these sort of lovely stories about how people are um, you know experiencing being trapped on their balcony or, or within their homes so um, mm. 27 languages and, 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 and reached 209 million unique households so that was something that was born out of this um, situation um, and it was really nice to not only feature our talent that we have really good um, relationships with but also our audience were able to participate as well and, and um, user generated content has been you know excellent within this time when people are at home and they have you know creativity that they need to to kind of ex explore. Excellent well it's, it's great to hear that you guys are doing a good job of uh, thinking outside the box and as you say uh, necessity is indeed the mother of all invention. Um, uh, next up I'd like to ask uh, Nick uh, again welcome um, can you describe uh, the, the biggest effects of COVID-19 on the B2B content marketplace uh, and content demand amongst broadcasters and streaming platforms? Um, and in particular, I know you're very keen to sort of discuss the demand for finished content and indeed the effects on content pricing. Sure, yeah, thanks very much, James. Um, well, I think obviously there was already a seismic change going on in the industry before COVID hit. And I think one of the impacts has been it's ramped up, accelerated that that change. So uh, the major international streaming platforms were net beneficiaries of this situation in the sense that the nature of their production cycles, they're much longer. So they had a lot of original commissions that were in post and uh, were able to be released. So that from a consumer's point of view, there was less of a noticeable change in, in their output. Um, at the same time, there's this drive towards more exclusivity amongst the streaming networks um, uh, owned by the studios. And so there has been a short term uh, um, benefit and probably a long term effect um, on that side. But what does that mean for, for the rest of the market and, and how people are adapting? I mean, I think during the COVID crisis, there's been much more focus on um, acquirable content as, as, you, as you just mentioned um, and specifically um, familiar brands I mean uh, Tracy was talking about um, about that a moment ago I mean my kids are obsessed with Spongebob now you know uh, it, uh, there are some um, some wonderful products that uh, people are going back to um, that they you know as the lockdown wore on there was more of a sense of um, realization amongst viewers that there was going to be more viewing time and so they started to revisit stuff and I think that uh, particularly near broad, linear broadcasters have been asked to take advantage of that. Um, they've obviously had to fill sports gaps as well um, and uh, so there have been a, a number of factors that have, have driven people towards uh, finished content. Um, 
I think we'll probably touch on, on kids content animation in particular and how that's potentially a beneficiary from, from the situation as well. But um, I think in, in short, it's particularly in MENA where the production times tend to be very short. I mean, with Ramadan, we're, we're releasing our Ramadan report um, at the end of next week. Um, you know, 20% down in terms of the number of shows. UAE and Saudi up in terms of their own productions, but Egypt, Levant, most places down in terms of the, 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 the volume of hours because of the, um, inevitably, the, uh, the, the effect on production timelines. But to what Khaloub was saying before, there will be an increase. Uh, I mean, I think everyone's been using the writing time and there'll be a, a boost, more and more a rapid boost to original production after lockdown eats, eases. Excellent. Okay, thank you very much, Nick. Um, Catherine, welcome. Um, uh, calling us from Kenya today. Um, I'd be very keen to get your perspective on how long, well, sorry, indeed, what specific challenges around content production and procurement um, that you've noticed both in Kenya and the broader East Africa region? Okay, so first, when this happened, no one was ready much more we in this side of the region because um, we, we rely very specifically on, on um, we plan everything a year in advance. So for example, anything that needed to be on air in 2020 was planned for in 2019. So when COVID happened, two things happened. The major one first, we lost um, advertising revenue. So that dropped. As free-to-air TV channels, we rely heavily on advertisers' revenue, so and that helps us to procure content. That helps us also to produce local content ourselves. So when it's not coming in, then that's a huge challenge for us. Uh, so that's one. The second thing is some of our international partners could not um, commit to sending us the content as planned last year because their production schedules were also affected. So you find we had to go back looking uh, at several catalogs, deciding, okay, what comes next? What can you offer? And that's because, uh, for example, the Filipino telenovelas we air on some of our entertainment channels, uh, they, they couldn't do anything because the content is not dubbed. So that's one challenge. However, the flip side to that is our news channel, uh, KTN News, has thrived in this season. And that's because COVID has been the new story. So you find a lot of people have engaged uh, with that channel a lot, asking questions. There's been lots of stakeholder involvement, including the government, the Ministry of Health. And that has really worked for us, for the news channel, but the entertainment channels have, have kind of struggled a bit. And, and lastly, with everyone being at home from March um, till end of May, uh, that's a couple of weeks ago. So you had the whole family unit at home. So you have your parents, the, the babies, the young adults. And so as the programming team, we have to sit and decide what we want to put on air when, because then we've never been faced with, with such a dilemma where everyone is at home at the same time and you need to be able to capture that audience and hopefully uh, attract advertisers as much as you can. So we've had to navigate some of those problems the last couple of months. Um, a wholesale headache by the sounds of things. Um, we can only hope things start to improve. Um, just to move things back to, uh, to you, Khaloud, um, with that in mind, with Catherine's comments in mind, um, how long do you believe major TV networks that aren't able uh, to resume production on a similar timeline to what you've uh, already enjoyed, uh, how long will they be able to keep users engaged without producing new content? I think um, networks, things will start going back to normal as of September. Um, the, the reality is consumption of content on all mediums, uh, whether traditional TVs or OTTs, uh, have increased by but five times based on the, um, on the data uh, received. So I think, and uh, we feel at least uh, in the Middle East, uh, networks are working, networks are looking at actually also at their strategies. Also there are some new uh, genres of content that are being requested that have never been requested before, like lifestyle content that focus on how we are going to live after uh, COVID. So for example, so we, we receive lots of um, content, even uh, there are uh, impact or like influence from government on content that is, uh, that have CSR messages 
on um, you know preventive medicine on a changing of lifestyles things that need to happen so the responsibility of of networks or producers into impacting lives after as of september of what need to be changed and what not what need to be uh, taken in account so we have like requests for two lifestyle magazine but it's not about fashion or it's about the normal lifestyles magazine you see but it's about you know lifestyle style trend and what need to be um, you know focused on and how people need to change their lifestyles while still going on with, li with the life so there's that's that's one something which is like reality doc uh, in entertainment content that was not really on that on demand before is on demand um, and I think that will be uh, the focus of lots of uh, daytime uh, and um, you know pre uh, drive time or uh, content across at least at least in the Middle East so but we feel that uh, things are going to be not normal but semi normal because everyone is need to, to think of their uh, September schedule. So we have like Q4, uh, October, December requests, uh, even from um, CSR government, um, governments to some CSR campaigns. So um, I think September is the time where we'll see things, the, the wheel will start rolling again. Excellent. Um, do any other panelists have a thought on that September timeline? Is that perhaps um, perhaps too premature, or is that realistic? Um, Nick, do you have any um, do you have any thoughts on that? Um, look, broadcasters have got to fill schedules twenty four seven, and as I mentioned before, I mean one of the nice things about Mina is we are very um, able to move quickly um, and I think uh, you know script development can happen faster and so forth and, and we as fluid has mentioned we've, we've had the opportunity to uh, to use this time to, to for for the development as well but um, I mean speaking as the, the CEO of a marketplace of content I think that um, there is an opportunity also for international distributors and producers um, in MENA I mean at the moment Mina's recognised internationally as one of the most challenging markets, probably the most challenging market to sell finished content into. But mm. the fact is there are dozens of high quality Latin American producers out there. There are producers in Korea, Japan, um, Central East, Eastern Europe, which is not just the US and, and uh, the English speaking world. There are lots of really high quality shows out there that are looking to come in. So, I mean, you know, in a world where the streaming networks are growing so rapidly, I think it's important on a territory, country by country basis for, for broadcasters as well as streaming networks to think about their audience. And in the, even in the absence of proper measurement, because that's another thing we really struggle with in MENA, we need to be uh, looking at what's going to, to drive that audience. That's not to say that regional productions don't have their place, and as Khalud is rightly saying, I mean, there's a change in, in appetite now and, and new new content types need to be introduced as well but I mean with the best one in the world we don't have the production budgets to produce uh, lots and lots of originals right the way through the schedule every, every week so I think that um, there is a, a now a, 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 it should be a little more focused from particularly from the broadcasters on acquiring um, finished product both regionally and also internationally Great. Thank you very much. Um, I think it's about time we uh, heard from our audience. Um, that brings us up to our first poll. Um, the question for which is, um, is there a legitimate concern that the current climate could render some production companies redundant and maybe even give rise to influencers and celebrities who produce their own content? Um, just while we wait for our panelists to complete that. Catherine, do you have any particular thoughts on, uh, on this issue? Do you think, is that a possibility? Okay, so I don't think that there's ever a day production companies will be relevant or redundant. But also what I've noticed is uh, there's a huge surge of um, user-generated content, like Tracy said. So in our case, we've discovered lots of people doing amazing things online. 
and, and we're working into those collaborations. And those people are mostly celebrities and influencers. So this time has, you know, been a discovery for them in the sense that, whoa, wait a minute, people are actually consuming my content uh, because they need to. So whether these are comedians, beauticians, or just short form dramas, it's, it's become, it's just blown up, especially in this part of the region. And as broadcasters, what you find we're doing is now looking for these gems online and, and collaborating with them and even going together to advertise us to say, look, we want to do this together. Could you put some money here? And we've seen that working, especially over the last one month. As for that pushing away um, production houses, uh, it will just be a fight, you know, like how we all fight to get the ratings and the revenue. Uh, so that's exactly, I think, what it will be. So it will be a case of may the, may the best one win, may the one who has the best to provide win. Okay, thank you, thank you very much. I think we've just had a question from the Q&A section. Also for you, Catherine, on this. Um, oh, actually, we just had, before we do anything else, our poll results have come in. 55% uh, of our audience uh, believe there is a legitimate concern that the current climate could indeed Render some production companies redundant. Um, quite a um, quite a suggestion indeed. Um, uh, just a reminder to all our audience: uh, please feel free to use the uh, Q and A function, and please feel to free please feel free even to uh, post your questions to our panelists, as well as using the chat function for um, well, for conversation amongst your or yourselves, audience members. Um, so, moving the discussion forward, um, Catherine, again back to you just for a second. Um, so we talked pre briefly about the challenges you're facing um, at KTN, um, but how do you plan to adapt to these challenges, um, chiefly associated with uh, content production and procurement? Okay, so the first thing that happened for us, which was good for our market in, and economy in general, is uh, a week ago, uh, the president extended the coffee time, meaning that people can go back to the office from 8 to 5 because coffee was now extended to 9 p.m. So you find that there's lots of activity happening. Uh, we, we are back to selling, we're back to the office, of course, observing all the safety and health protocols, uh, like Hulu uh, mentioned in her, on her film set. Um, so it will be a long journey, but one that we are very hopeful for because even the conversations with advertisers are now up and alive. So they're the ones calling for meetings and, and saying, okay, where, where do we pick off? What, what can we do together? And they just, the good thing is they do not want the traditional way that they have been spending. So they want, they want everything on every media. And I think people are realizing that it, they've missed out on a lot the last three months. So how do you recover that time? How do you recover those eyeballs? How do you make your product relevant? And, and we partnering and collaborating um, with, you know, the, on, the influencers and the celebrities online to create content. And these are people with huge followings is a great attraction for them. So from a local standpoint, that's one. On the international scene, what's happening is uh, we have international content distributors who've approached us to say, look, you may not have the money to acquire content now, but we can give you the content and we can both go out looking for the revenues. And then we share that, we split that, you know, whatever percentages we agree on. And this was a welcome surprise for us because especially for sports content, and most of it is, is uh, what do you call it, library content, but still very attractive to our audiences here. So we've had like three, four offers and you're looking at it as something that's incredibly viable in the near future to, to, to walk on or rather to approach. And it's, it's super attractive actually. And not to mention that most of it is also coming for free in the sense of yes, is what's going to be for revenue share and is what's going to be like the ad. So the content distributors want their products on air, which is a good thing for both parties. Good, thank you. Uh, Tracy, I noticed you nodding, nodding there a couple of times. Do you have anything to um, add uh, in terms of what Catherine's just said? Um, I mean, I think, yeah, I, I agree with Catherine. And if we were all in a, on a sofa together, I would turn and, and nod. But so, um, uh, yeah, I mean, I think that, uh, um, you know, Catherine's point about uh, influencers and, and, and a talent strategy that, that they're looking at, I think that, you know, lots of broadcasters, um, you know, use that relationship. Um, we have in Viacom and in particular for Comedy Central, we have um, really strong connections with, with, our, with our talent and they aren't 
uh, only isolated in it, you know on our linear channels they have voices on social they have um you know they they create content outside of that as well so i you know i think it's something that we have it's it's not a new phenomena that is happening with covid um but i think that um, the ability to be able to um, generate content at home and whether that's Trevor Noah with the with the um, daily distancing show where we normally have a beautiful glossy studio um, you know that connection still to the audience is is really important for for, for us as broadcasters and also for the talent um, I don't think that production will ever be redundant because there is a you know a quality control that that you just can't get from a from for, from a home or, or user generated um, but I think it does give us the opportunity to explore different ways of capturing content and, 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 and connecting with our audiences and I'm sure going forward some of those will remain in the future because they work really well our audience love them and um, you know and it, we, we adapt to, to the new normal I think it will be a really good balance between the two. Thank you. Um, back to you Nick. Um, what have been the uh, the biggest effects of COVID nineteen on media, on Middle East and Africa? Uh, sorry, apologies, apologies. Uh, Middle East and North Africa broadcast the revenue and profitability. Um, what have been the main trends that you've noticed around advertising revenues and market share? Um, which subscription models are working? Which aren't? Uh, and what are the implications for producers and distributors? Well, I think we've actually we've covered these points a little bit. Um, in the, the, the preceding conversation, I think that, uh, yeah, from a market share point of view, the irony for the, the bitter irony for the broadcasters is that they're, I mean, according to TBI, um, this uh, webinar I was, I was looking at uh, a couple of days, um, a couple of weeks ago, the audience is still 70% linear. Um, and most of that is watching live, not catch up. So, and yet the revenues on the advertising side don't reflect that at all. And, and um, I'm encouraged by what uh, Catherine was saying earlier on. I mean, I think that there are signs. When we talk to broadcasters uh, uh, every day, and um, certainly it's, it's, not, it's not a friendly picture that they're facing at the moment in terms of advertising um, in MENA. And I think it's, it's exposed the systematic issue we have in MENA of lack of audience data. Um, or a lack of um, uh, passive audience data, I should say, so that, you know, advertisers have tended to focus on digital media instead, um, particularly the, uh, the big ones, um, Facebook and Google. Um, but, uh, you know, there, there are shafts of light there in terms of um, opportunities, particularly as, as, as Tracy and, and Catherine were talking about, the, uh, the notion of, um, of more integrated uh, advertising. And, um, when it comes to the subscription side of things, again, there's going to there's been a move towards um, uh, SVOD and away from um, pay, partly driven by the lack of sport. Um, and you know, as I alluded to at the start of the conversation, I mean, it's generally favoured the bigger players because of their content portfolios being larger, their production cycles being longer. So. I'm concerned more for the smaller s players. I think they're really, really important um, to the ecosystem. You know, they help producers, they, uh, they help uh, get new content out there and um, they create more diversity in the market. So um, I'm very keen that those players don't just kind of get homogenized into the world of Disney and, and, and Netflix. I think um, OSN has been a particular success story through this crisis. I think, um, you know, if you look back just you know look as early as, as January I mean people were writing that company off and uh, suddenly you have a, a combination of a captive audience scenario plus a very um, wise shrewd decision to to Nick to to take the Disney plus exclusively um, and suddenly OSN is very much back in the game um, I think it's the question will be how long that can continue once uh, the, the sort of the, the lockdown situation eases. The Disney deal is obviously a time-bound deal. They, they're going, they've had enormous success internationally. One has to assume that eventually they're going to start looking at going B to see themselves, um, perhaps you know, in three or four years' time. So OSN needs to capitalise on this short-term opportunity to really like keep their brand 
pushing up there. I mean, if we look compare with another market, UK, for example, I saw that now TV is, is shrinking compared with Amazon and Netflix. So it does concern me. I think that the, the other network we shouldn't forget is Shahid, NBC. And I, I, they have st consistently been strategically on top of the, uh, the market. And I think that all the indications are that they are doing that again. It looks like they could have their own ecosystem within the, the TV sphere of, of the Middle East, um, taking in other people's channels as well as product. Um, one, other thing I, Sorry, one, Sorry. one other thing I wanted to mention um, was, you know, at, at Mina TV, we've noticed a significant demand for Arabic content internationally. In fact, I was, I was surprised. I assumed that most of the, 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 uh, the volumes we'd see would be from regional networks looking for international product. But actually, we've seen inquiries from America, we've seen inquiries from South America, from uh, Asia, lots and lots of different regions looking for Arabic content. And I suppose if you think about it, it's logical. There are Arab diasporas all around the world. OTT networks are easy to set up. So I think there is an opportunity um, which is still not fully exploited for Arabic content to, now I'm thinking here about your question about the producers and distributors and, and how they can benefit. Thank you very much. Um, we've just got an interesting question here from the audience. Um, if social life goes back to normal by spring 2021, according to researchers, um, do you think there will be a return to the normal production models that we know? Uh, or will there be a form of PTSD in the production field? Um, is there any panelists that would like to take this one? Yeah, can I? I think... I think, you know, the experience we went through will always uh, make us very, um, not hesitant, but careful when we get into our production and the parking capital we put uh, into the production, because we always have in back of our mind that this could come back. And it's just an experience how we will cope with it. Um, so it is uh, always, it's our belief that uh, production is never going to go back as it was before, uh, even if life come life come goes back to normal. Because as producer, we learned a lot uh, from uh, from the experience. Is that you always need to keep that in mind, and you key, need to be much more prepared. So it's as if each production house started. As, uh, as far as uh, us are concerned, Art Format Lab, it's like you need to have a crisis management uh, procedures um, on all levels of your business, whether financially, you know, on management-wise, connectivity-wise, uh, or uh, everything. So it will go to normal, but it is everyone have to change uh, their procedures and their risk margins when you get back into production. Absolutely. Um, moving forward, I think um, I think it's time for our next poll of the day. Um, the question of which is, has the time come for film producers to stream their content into people's homes and to bypass traditional cinemas? Uh, responses for which are, yes, the move to paid streaming was inevitable, uh, or no, uh, cinemas bring in far greater revenue and are still loved by the masses. Um, while we wait for those results, do it. Would any panelists like to share their thoughts on this particular question? Nick, I see you smiling. I feel like you're. I was thinking about my good friend John Luca Chakra, um, who is like I, I know he's he's been keeping a very very keeping us all aware of what's going on cinema wise and and um, and where we are um, in terms of getting back to, to normal. I mean, I don't want to influence your poll result, so I. I, I <laughs> I'll tell you my view, but only after the numbers come in, if you see what I mean. Okay, by all means. I'm very pro-cinema. <laughs> uh, Tracy, do you, have any, do you have any thoughts on this, this topic? Yeah, I mean, I think I'm probably aligned with what, what Nick was going to say, is that there is a, you know, a, a particular experience you get at the cinema that, that you know, you, you don't get if you directly um, stream it into people's homes. Um, I mean, we can see here... Um, you know, from a from a personal point of view, when there is a, a you know drive-in cinemas, people want that experience of the big screen and all, all of the things. You, I'm sure all of us on this panel are huge movie lovers, and so with that, 
um, experience of, of, of film comes the experience of, of where you are when you watch it. So let's see what the poll says, if people agree or not. Um, I think I'm... Oh, here we go. Um, so oh, it's close. <laughs> a close one, yeah. Um, very split. So 50% of our audience believe that the move to paid streaming is in fact inevitable, while 47% uh, believe that, as just to echo your comments there, Tracy, um, that cinemas are still a much loved institution of, of our world. Um, interesting stuff there. Um, not quite sure where I sit on that one personally, but uh, there we go. Um, uh, moving forward, um, just to go back to you again, Tracy, um, uh, how do you believe um, entertainment channels that have been deprived of content are sort of still managing to create refreshing and engaging entertainment experiences in spite of the current situation? Uh, yeah, that, I mean, that's a, a, a great question. I think it's, as, as Catherine was talking about, <clears throat> excuse me, earlier, it's it's a combination of, uh, of lots of things. So um, Nick mentioned SpongeBob. So, you know, we had a SpongeBob pop-up channel uh, that was on OSN and heavily consumed uh, by people that love SpongeBob, both new episodes <clears throat> and our are, are kind of, um, you know, the entire 12 seasons of Spongebob that exists. Um, so there are always um, ways of planning channels and, 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 and planning the experience so that you can utilize not only your new content, but also ones that you know are well loved. Um, <clears throat> so, so some of it is, you know, just about being really clever in, in, in how you deliver to, to audiences that probably don't get as much opportunity as they have done on lockdown to, to consume your content. So as long as you're, you know, it's good that, you know, um, consumption is higher. Um, and so the, the, the way people can, can discover your content has, has been increased. Um, that said, <clears throat> at the same time, there is still content that does need to be produced. And, um, and I think that that, um, that kind of co collective momentum to, to, to be able to try and connect with audiences and, and, and still create content, even if um, studios are shut or even if people can't be on, in close proximity to each other. <clears throat> Sorry, we did, um, we did a show, um, we, we have just recently done a show called Comedians in Quarantine. I mean, it does what it says on the tin. We had our comedians that were in quarantine, had lots of stories that they wanted to, uh, to tell. And that's been, um, you know, a, a, a really nice project across Viacom CBS to be able to do. We have, um, you know, crisis creates content. So what our comedians are talking about is what all of our audience is experiencing. Um, and, and it becomes really, really relatable, but in that filter of Comedy Central. So your, your comedians almost talking directly to you um, at home while you're in quarantine and how they're feeling about it has been, has been another um, really good success. So I think that it's great news, as Halud says, the, the kind of gradual restarting of production. Um, and you know it's it's about balance it's about being safe and and following the the guidelines dependent on on where your your production is happening mm -hmm. um but at the same time as there are lots of very clever ways that that content producers can still produce content that is that is really relevant uh, to their audience so yeah uplifting stories we've done you know at home music specials um you know we've seen a whole new variety of content that that's come that was never imagined before before lockdown so i you know i think that it's you know it's it, entertainment experiences are still possible to deliver to your audience despite all of this global um you know worldwide challenge and certainly one of the things you've sort of touched upon there is content that is uh, particularly relatable, you know, given the situations that people are currently going through, right? That's obviously something that's um, bound to draw in the masses, I would have thought. Yeah, absolutely. And when, when I mean, always, we, we always want our content to reflect our audiences for it to be connectable and relatable and, and humorous. And so I think that, that none of that has changed, whether we're, you know, in a, in a pandemic or not. Um, but I think it does, it really, you know, when you're, you're able to directly, everyone has been affected, you know, in, 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 and it's very, very relatable worldwide, um, which is a lovely connection to have. Uh, with your audience. Absolutely. 
Um, just back to you, Nick. Um, what have you particularly noticed about what broadcasters and streamers are currently buying and airing? Um, and what do you expect them, or what kind of trends do you expect to see over the next few months with that regard? It's a, it's a good cue for um, a little bit of a, uh, a plug because we're actually presenting next week uh, uh, as uh, our uh, analysis of Ramadan 2020 and, and we are also um, producing uh, a detailed market analysis um, for for our members. So if you're not already a registered on Mina.tv, why aren't you? <laughs> because uh, it's all very, very useful data. Um, in terms of... Um, of what we've seen trend-wise, I, I alluded to the fact that, uh, as would be expected, production was affected during Ramadan. Um, we did see a reduced number of shows. Um, I'm just looking at the, uh, the the data at the moment, just to remind myself a little bit. But I mean, I probably striking was to see the the growth and uh, of NBC Studios as a vehicle within the uh, the industry and how important that they are becoming in in um, in not only we think of NBC as a TV network, but uh, that they are actually producing uh, a lot of original, high-quality original content now, and at the sort of the, the high end of things, they're one of the few entities that can really put afford to put several hundred thousand dollars an episode into into drama shows, for example. Um, in terms of the 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 range of content being consumed, uh, we've. We do have access to, to audience data. Um, I don't have the stats in yet. Um, so, uh, you know, we, but, but uh, we, in terms of the recent couple of months, we've had some challenges getting the data through uh, because of the, uh, the, the lockdown process, but that data is in now and we're currently um, evaluating it and, and we'll be in a much better position to answer that when we release our, um, our report in, in, a, in probably about the global report, the, sorry, the regional report will be in about two and two and a half weeks time. Thank you very much. Uh, Catherine, we've got a question from the audience here, which I think is um, quite appropriate to some of the things you've touched upon earlier. Um, how do we distinguish and determine what context to air at a specific time? Um, and also to ensure that it, that it is consumed by the correct audience? <laughs> it can never be perfect, but we rely heavily on research. So we commission maybe companies like Nix or so our local version of um, Nix company uh, to, to get for us uh, research on what do audiences first of all want to watch and also the why, because if you understand the why, then we have the opportunity to look far and wide for that content. And then we also ask questions like what time they prefer to watch it. So of course, uh, the majority of the audiences, the times they choose is where we place the program. But also we take risks for, and I'll give an example. So we were the first channel about five, six years ago to introduce Filipino telenovelas in the market. So even when I had Nick talk about Arabic content, my man has been like, hmm, okay, that could be something interesting to also introduce here because it's not here, it's, it's not in this uh, East African region. So we were the first ones to do it. We previously were just doing Mexican, Spanish telenovelas, which are huge. So bringing in Filipino was totally off the script. But right now, all the TV channels have Filipino and that's because they, uh, they've become super big compared to the Mexicans that we grew up on. So we take risks um, and we decide this will work because it's a storyline and it's different and these are stars in their countries. But of course, a lot of marketing goes into that. So there are various factors that go into informing what content do you want to air and where, and in our case, which channel, because we have two entertainment channels, one uh, news channel and one for farmers. So for example, a show like uh, Farmer Wants a Wife, do we put it on the farmer's channel or do we put it on, on the entertainment channel? So some of those decisions, you just, you know, it's balls in the air, you decide where it flips and, and, and you take that decision and it works. And if it doesn't, then you learn from that and, and you move on from there. Great, thank you very much. Um, we're now going to move on to um, our third and final poll uh, of today's session. Um, question for which is, will social distancing rules that come, into, uh, that come into force on set impact the quality of TV production? 
Uh, not at all, to some extent, or very much so. Um, just just a quick... on something for a moment, James, on, on, on Catherine's point, if I may. Just... Uh, sure, in the meantime, yeah, while we're waiting for the results of the poll, absolutely. Yeah. Just to reiterate, so just to, 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 to sort of further develop Catherine's point, I mean, going to, you mentioned Filipino content being sold into to Africa. I mean, it's very interesting to see Filipino content being sold into the home of telenovelas in Latin America. We see that. Even more surprising, you see Turkish content, which of late has traveled so well internationally, actually outperforming, you know, and it's, it's, it's something the Latin producers have been very concerned about, that they, they, for a while the, Latin, the Turkish content was actually outperforming the Latin content. So globally, this idea of different um, origins of content having a resonance elsewhere is really, really important. It's the, it's the most important content trend, trend that we've seen sort of over the last sort of cycle of the business before COVID hit. Thank you, thank you. Um, just to go back to back to our poll question, I was keen to get Khaloud's uh, opinion on whether social distancing rules will impact the quality of TV production. I mean, like obviously you're kind of, you're back on set. Um, you've given us some of your experiences already to this point, but do you think, um, is it gonna have a long-term effect on output? It, yes, it will. I'm, I'm an optimist and uh, seeing the instructions and guidelines we're getting uh, from the authorities, it's, uh, it's relaxing by the day. Um, it's what content you select to produce in which period. So um, like, uh, you know, the live TV shows, you can do them, you know, uh, even, you know, the way you design and you write your uh, uh, content have to be changed. But uh, we believe that this is, will change quickly and gradually. Um, and we, as content producer, we opt to go to the type of content that without compromising quality and wait to the restrictions to be uh, like relieved and back to normal. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so we've got the results in of our poll um, to some extent. So a fairly middle, middle ground answer, but 25% of our audience believe that social distancing rules will have no effect um, on the quality of TV production. Of oh, 60 16 percent believe they will um we're just going to grab a couple more questions from our audience now um just one more for you catherine again um just an interesting question here um have you ever felt like you've reached rock bottom when it comes to program acquisition especially during this time all the time not just this time <laughs> Especially when you have to negotiate for something you want and you perhaps do not have the monies for it at that point in time. So because what happens is um, we present the catalog to potential advertisers and say this is what we plan to bring and we, we, the reason we want to bring this is because here's the research supporting that it will fly. And so at times with the advertisers, they say, mm, let's, let's see, just bring it, put it on there, let's see. So you have to go negotiate on the license fee with, with the distributor or the producer and there's that back and forth. And yes, of course, you, you, you hit rock bottom, but you do what you can. You meet in the middle, especially if you really want something, you have to get it. And then, and, and you hope it works for you somewhere down the line. So yeah, it, it, it is not, rock bottom is the normal. Okay. Um, I think um, we're running out of time, so I'm just going to um, ask you all to kind of um, give a very brief kind of summary of the discussion, or rather where you think uh, the next challenges and opportunities lie. Uh, Tracy, what, what are your kind of overall sentiments uh, regarding the next steps for content production and procurement, uh, and what's next? Um, I mean, I think that, you know, adaptability will have to be what's next because we can't kind of, you know, see how, how quickly and, uh, and how different the, the, the world will look afterwards. I think that as long as um, we bear in mind that, you know, 
quality content and good storytelling remains at the core of all the decisions that you make um, and you you know we all have the ability and flexibility to be able to to roll with um, these these challenges whatever they may be um, but I'm very confident that um, these some of this um, new ways of working will be here to stay and that's great to be to, to be able to have some you know new ways to to deliver content or to secure content or to write content um, and I think that that's the you know positive uh, way forward is um, you know new models are emerging and that's great uh, and marrying them up with really um, secure and successful traditional models will be the the, the best way forward. But adaptability is key. Um, Khalud, um, what are your thoughts uh, or final thoughts? Um, I believe that there's a change in the general mood of the audience which will uh, uh, open in, uh, new opportunities as far as the kind of and the type and the genres of content to be produced. Uh, I just want to tackle, for example, on influencers and social media. When you look at the data across the Middle East, you see like a massive drop in the kind of social media influencers and uh, a, a growth uh, in um, followership for for more different types uh, of influencers. So I think the change in mood uh, in our content, whether scripted or non-scripted to our uh, uh, audience post-COVID. Great, thank you. Um, uh, Catherine, um, final thoughts? I think I'll just latch on to what Tracy said, and this is just keeping our eyes peeled out for the new models. Uh, there's a lot of new that has just sprung up from literally every, everywhere you look, everything is new. And so, and especially for us broadcasters, free to air, in, 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 you know, to be particular, how do we not become irrelevant in this age of um, the celebrities and influencers doing their thing online and your Netflixes and we still have to be there providing what people need on air um, and not just being stuck pre-COVID. So we, we in that um, rebounder, if I may call it, uh, to just find how do we do this, how do we navigate, but I'm hopeful. Thank you very much. Uh, Nick, over to you. As before COVID hit, the industry um, was already at a, in a, a crisis moment, whether it realised it or not. I think that uh, as a consumer, I love Netflix. I watch Amazon now. Um, there, there is a globalisation of the consumer experience. Um, as an industry person, that really concerns me because as an industry, as, as a thriving industry, we've got lots on lots of companies and, and uh, small and large around the world that are um, working to be creative and, and to work together. I think that uh, the opportunity lies in the, the transparency, the openness of the industry, not only regionally but globally. So the more that we make our content available to as many buyers as possible, the more that the industry is able to communicate and work with itself effectively, the more we have good quality data whether it's audience data, marketplace data, um, and the ability, accessibility of buyers and sellers around the world, the more chance the industry has of producing alternatives to like a one-size-fits-all viewing experience, which is where we're headed right now. Great, thank you very much. Um, I think that brings us to the end of today's discussion. Um, a big thank you to all our panellists. Thank you all very much for, for making this discussion what it's been uh, and for providing your uh, broad insight uh, on an issue which is certain to be at the top of the agenda of broadcast media in the coming months and years. Um, thank you all very much. A big thank you to our audience for tuning in today. Uh, and just a reminder that we will see you at CABSAT from the 26th to the 28th of October 2020 at Dubai World Trade Centre. Thank you all very much and goodbye.